Hello, Eastern Borders podcast listeners. I am Joe Newton from the Historical Intentions podcast. After you're done with this podcast, why not come and give me a listen? If you love history being explored from angles you do not usually see in history classrooms, I think you'll enjoy my podcast. For instance, my last episode was on the Great Northern War and Corollus Rex, and covered viewpoints such as could the young Swedish king have won his war at all, and whether there was a moral justification for certain actions that happened in the war. All that and more on Historical Intentions with Joe Newton. Greetings, Tavarishi, and welcome to the Eastern Border. This episode came out so slowly that any hopes of mine of even sticking to a schedule have gone the way of the Soviet Union, pun intended. For now, the show is here, and I hope that you will enjoy it. There is a Latvian documentary film made in 1986 by director Yuri Spodniks called Va Viegl Butjaunam, or Is It Easy to Be Young in English? The movie focused on a very specific trial for hooliganism. In 1985, after a rock concert in Uogre, by one of the musically heavier, very punkish bands of the time, Parkons, a large amount of teenagers and other young people were running to catch a train back to our capital Riga. We didn't, and still don't allow people under 18 to drive cars here, and back then almost nobody had a car anyways. Besides, it's just a 45 minutes by train anyways. The emotions were still running hot after the concert, the train was stopped really full, a lot of people were standing, which tends to be normal here even now. Someone started singing, people joined in, drinking soon followed, and... After a while, they started vandalizing the train. Breaking windows, crushing light bulbs, destroying the chairs... the usual. The court decided that the damages were about 5,000 rubles large. That would be about $10,000 in today's money, I think. The Soviet court tried seven people for this, six of whom were under 18 during the trial. They all received different levels of punishment, the heaviest being three years in prison, which was later softened to just a year. The movie focuses on the court, asking whether or not the trial itself wasn't a politicized show trial event, intended to curb any free thinking and dissent in the Soviet youth. The movie clearly shows the disillusionment about the Soviet government and life in general at the time. The youth, they are unhappy, they see no purpose in anything, and just think that the Soviet life in general is a pointless existence. There are elements of the Latvian punk subculture, shown in the movie, small pockets of young people who are in a pseudo-Buddhist club sect thing trying to reach enlightenment, some other people who make experimental cinema, a guy who works as a nurse in a hospital while trying to get into university, and... yes, young people who had returned from the Afghanistan war. The guy who has returned from the war comments that the Soviet materialistic life has changed the people. He agrees with the rest of them, but there is a very personal moment in his speech when he states that the people at home have forgotten the values of the soul. The Soviet life has made them empty. With shaking hands and tears in his eyes, he says that the most human thing he had experienced was a sharing of a found cigarette between three soldiers during the war after a battle, so that everyone would have a smoke. That was the true brotherhood for him, something that he's missing in the Soviet life. After he's returned from the war, being unwillingly and forcefully dragged into it, he's mourning the loss of his comrades, how all of this was completely pointless, and how now it's very hard for him to live in the society again. The movie itself later served as an inspirational tool, a call to arms in a way, if you will, during the time of Atmod or Rebirth, when we gained an independence from the USSR, when it finally collapsed. The young had finally found their purpose, at least for a while. The Afghani war traumatized the USSR to a very great extent. My parents' generation lost their friends in the war, and for the most part, those friends were dragged into it without ever wanting to go, <clears throat> and without ever wanting to wage war in a foreign country against people whom they had no quarrels with or relation to. Andra Gustafsson has written a book on this time period. The book is called Trichraus Carousels, or The Tricolor Carousel. It's not a historical book by any means, 
it's a work of fiction concerning the young people of the time, and how a biking accident and the, and the Afghanistan war changed their lives. The people in the book are not real, but the mood and the emotions certainly are. So are the events that happened. The infamous sink coffins, for one. The metal boxes where the dead soldiers who were brought, brought back from the war were carried. They were welded shut. Some had a little slit in them, if the soldier wasn't mutilated, so that the relatives could see the face of the dead man. Most were just completely enclosed. Metal boxes, like I said. Filled with the remains of a dead person. Parts of remains of a dead person. The Afghanistan war left huge scars in our society. But today, the war and the veterans who fought in it are almost forgotten. We have some of their stories for sure, but even now the surviving soldier feels left alone by the country, the society and the state. For the first time ever, some parts of the Red Army entered Afghanistan in 1929 already, when they tried to restore to power the current ruler of Afghanistan, Amanullah Khan, which had been usurped by Bachai Sakao, which was apparently a pro-British effort there, then the USSR tried to stop the British influence from expanding. Now, this operation turned to be unsuccessful, but the Soviet Union still tried to support their neighboring country in other ways, mostly through monetary expenses and sending them some technology and just whatever great powers do to influence their neighbors. But Afghanistan at this point was mostly Finlandized, as it's a term now, by trying to support the USSR in whatever important political questions there were actualized at the moment. Now, skipping forward, in 1978, in the so-called April Revolution, the old Muhammad Dauda regime was toppled, and the power was grabbed by the Marxistic Communist People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. But the communists in Afghanistan met with a serious resistance and serious critique of their social, economical, and political strategy, which tended to turn into violent skirmishes between the oppositional forces and the communist forces in Afghanistan. There wasn't much unity in the Afghani, Afghani Communist Party either. Such situation created important and very, very valid doubts in Moscow, that Afghanistan could just slip away from the Soviet sphere of influence, which would be a harsh blow for the USSR's strategic interests. Now, the Afghani government, at this point led by Nuhur Muhammad Taraki, in the official meetings with the USSR embassy, representatives of the KGB and the leaders of the Communist Party, had been always asking for the Soviet army to come in Afghanistan and help them against the opposition, because they didn't trust their own army. But the USSR's response to this was always a negative one. Now, in the September of 1979, in Afghanistan there was a coup. Coup amidst their own communist party. This wasn't a democratical coup. The leader of the country became Hazifullah Amin. This turn of events seriously worried the leadership of the USSR. At the end of November, the Soviet ambassador was recalled from Afghanistan. The ambassador's name was Alexander Puznanov. After talks with the representative of the Afghanistan's new president, Amin, the Communistic Party Central Committee's Politburo in the 12th December approved decision number 176-125 about the situation A, in which it was decided to Quote, give the brotherly nation of Afghanis international help. In the same year, at the 12th December, the 1st Muslim Battalion, under the command of a major Habib Halabayev, entered Afghanistan. This Muslim Battalion was under the command of the GRU, which was, as I remind, as I remind you, the head intelligence directorate, the analogue of the CIA for the Soviet Union. Such Muslim battalions were created specifically for battles in Afghanistan and other southern regions of the USSR, and mostly soldiers and officers from the Middle, Middle Asia and Caucasus republics were serving there, as to make them more 
cooperative with with the Afghani populace and and be just more likely to be supported. In the following days, even more elements of the Soviet army entered uh, the country, and of course they were closely followed by the special units of the KGB. Special units of the KGB being sent there to carry on repressions, shootings, incarcerations, and other nasty, nasty things with the dissidents there. In the 25th of December, the Soviet 14th Army uh, started entering the Afghanistan territory. At this time, the President Amin, which was still very pro-Soviet and very communistic, thanked the Soviet government for their help and gave out an order to the Afghanistan army to support the Soviet soldiers when and however possible. But, at the evening of the December 27th, a KGB operation started. The operation was called Storm 333, or Storm 333. It was planned by the leader of the KGB, Yuri Andropov, which ended up succeeding Brezhnev as the leader of the country after, after his death. The aim of this operation was to kill the leader of Afghanistan, Mr. Amin, to create a, a regime completely trustworthy and reliable to Kremlin, basically to make a puppet state out of Afghanistan. A GRU special unit in an assault took the Amin's castle, while the KGB special unit Alpha shot the president and his five-year-old son, but the Amin's wife and daughter were sent to the Kabul's, which is the capital of Afghanistan, central prison. Those Muslim battalion soldiers which were at that moment dressed as Afghani army's soldiers, had received an order so that they would tie a white cloth around their left arm so that they wouldn't be mistaken for the Amin's guards. But the air assault division of Vitebsk, the units of this division, who entered the place of events around the morning, hadn't been informed about this white cloth around the left arm, so they started shooting at their own people. Only after that, when the, when the paratroopers he- heard some Russian, Russian swear language on the other side, they stopped the firing at them. During the Operation Storm 333, around 200 Amin's bodyguards and other defenders of the castle were shot. The Soviet army lost 19 soldiers, but almost everyone else, around 660 people, received wounds of different different levels of injury. So, they were in a bind here. They just shot a president of an independent state, which, by the way, had invited the Soviet Union to enter the country with their military. To explain all of this, the chief of the KGB at that time, Yuri Andropov, kind of published and figured out a fairy tale, basically, that the Amin was an agent of the CIA. But the world's media obviously didn't buy this trick. So there was a there was a hard worsening of the relationships between the USSR and the Democratic West. Which is again why a part of the world's countries were boycotting the 1980 Olympic Games in Moscow. At the end of all of this, the power in Afghanistan went to a person called Babrak Kam- Karmal, the very pro-Kremlin person, and his government, of course, following the best traditions of the USSR, had been previously set up and created in Moscow, as they did in the Winter War, as they did when they occupied the Baltic states, you know, the best traditions of the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, there were two official stories about why do we need war in Afghanistan. The first one was about this so-called international duty sense towards the brotherly Afghan nation. As there weren't many people who would actually buy this version, they invented the, the second one in a hurry. The USSR's southern border should be defended from the American rockets who would be placed in Afghanistan if the Soviet military hadn't entered this country. For the most part of the common Soviet citizens, this version sounded much more believable and acceptable. 
Just after entering Afghanistan, parts of the Soviet military were being placed in the most strategically important spots, which the government of Afghanistan just couldn't keep under their own control. The first battle, where the Soviet army was fighting in, happened in the 10th and 11th January in 1980, when the Soviet army was suppressing the 20th Division's artillery detachment of the Afghani army rise up in Kabul. In March, parts of the Soviet army were involved into a massive governmental forces assault to the rebels under Kunar. But the United States Congress in April confirmed the operation called Cyclone, which meant a huge open and direct help, quote, <clears throat> to the Afghanistan's opposition. In the early years, it was about 15 to 30 million dollars a year, but in the 1987, this sum reached about 630 millions of dollars. But the United States weren't the only ones supporting the Mujahideens. Some Western European countries were giving help, and so was both China and Pakistan. In 1982, the seven largest groups of the opposition, which basically were all Mujahideens, united in the <clears throat> Afghanistan Mujahid Islamic Alliance. The alliance was formed by Gulbeddin Hekmatarjars, Afghanistan's Islamic Party, Burhanuddin Rabbani's Afghanistan's Islamic Society, Mohammad Nabi's Afghanistan's Islamic Revolution Movement, Mohammad Yunus or Hales Islamic Party, Saeed Ahmad Gilani's Afghanistan's National Islamic Front, Sebhatullah's Mojadadi's Afghanistan's National Safety Front, and Abdullah Rasulah Saijaf's Afghanistan's Liberation Islamic Union. Sounds like something from Life of Brian, doesn't it? <clears throat> the so-called Alliance of the Seven wasn't completely representative of everyone in Afghanistan, as multiple warlords didn't join it, such as Ahmad Dashah Massoud and Ismail Khan, which weren't allowing themselves to be put under any political control. The main mission of the Soviet army was to make sure that all of the state's territory were under control of the USSR and the marionette puppet state of Afghanistan. But, because of the active resistance of the Mujahideens, it didn't really work out. USSR's and the government's forces basically controlled the big cities, while the rural regions stayed in the control of the opposition forces. In 1986, around 70% of Afghanistan was under Mujahideen control. The government of Babrak Karmal had almost no support on the, with the people. In 1983, after the initiatives proposed by the International Society, there were some attempts to find some compromise between the warring sides, and there had been some attempts where, without the Communistic Party of Afghanistan, there would be some opposition parties in the government. But such sort of action wasn't approved by the Soviet Union, as its political goal was to turn Afghanistan into a typical country of a social orientation. But already in 1984, a lot of Soviet military analysts stated that it would be impossible to win this war. So, we have gotten to 1984 chronologically. But what about the soldiers then? What about how they felt and what was actually going on on the ground during the, these five years, which we have top to bottom covered? A bit? Well, we have accounts of these people. Well, some of them at least. One of the soldiers who entered Afghanistan as the very first ones who entered there in the 25th of December in 1979, just around Christmas, was the youngest sergeant Gunnar Srusinc, a Latvian, who, according to his specialty, was a chemist and a scout. A scout because that's what the what his military education, about which I have spoken in the previous episodes, gave him. Now he's a leader of the Latvian War Veterans of the Afghanistan War Association. About his departure to Afghanistan, Mr. Gunnar Srusinc states, <clears throat> quote, I was firstly involved in the warfare in Afghanistan in the 9th of the 25th to 26th of December of 1979. We were transferred with helicopters to the Afghanistan ground 
already armed so that we would wait for other USSR war equipment and would be transferred to other places of dislocation in the territory of Afghanistan. We weren't told about the fact that we would be sent to Afghanistan or on any other hotspot. We were told nothing. Previously, we were gathered in the spots of deployment where we weren't given any information. And further on, after some two weeks in the night, after raising us up after an alarm, it was stated that we would be sent to Afghanistan. When I actually got there, the place of this location was the province of Kududza. Throughout his service, Rusinch was in the different spots of Afghanistan where he did other military tasks which were connected with fighting the Mojahedins. He remembers his service as such, quote, I fought in different regions because this wasn't a front against front war. This was a guerrilla war. We were sent into many war warfare operations and mostly these operations were in the mountainous regions. I spent a lot of my time moving in columns and with separate armored vehicles from one city to another. In the result of all of this, we were under fire a lot of time. We had one military operation in the summer of 1980 where we lost almost a whole company. It was the occasional common raid not far from Kanuza province in the mountain region again where we had been sent military operation for a certain time to a certain spot. The forces of the raid had been ambushed, and the result of the following firefight in an unequal fight, a lot of losses had been made to our forces while the reinforcements came. I was amongst those who were sent to aid these forces trapped in this situation, as a result of which I was wounded myself. Gunnar Srusinch left Afghanistan in May 1981, and at that time... He was the oldest sergeant already. In the 14th April of 1983, another youngest sergeant, Ivar Skruminch, was also sent to Afghanistan, who had spent a half a year before that in the army studying anti-air defense, or to be more precise, in the anti-air rocket division. When Ivar Skruminch was sent to Afghanistan, he had been trusted with a command of rocket device machine in Kabul, which needed both guarding and, if need be, shooting from it. His and his group's main task was to defend the Soviet 40th Army's main headquarters. Kruminch spent all his service time in Kabul. But even the Afghani's capital wasn't calm, because Kruminch states that, quote, we were assaulted even when just we arrived in the Kabul's airport, end quote. And the shootings from the enemy side were with him always, almost every evening, all the time of his service. Afghan Mojahedins shot from the mountains both with mortars and machine guns, but mostly they used snipers, so it was very uncertain from which side did they even shoot. There were a lot of fallen between the Soviet soldiers in Kabul, both wounded and those who died. Krumich remembers that he basically got lucky and the bullet just passed him some 10 centimeters from his head. There were a lot of cases when the Afghans shot from the mountains with the Stinger rockets, obviously supported by the United States, towards Soviet aircraft. He remembers, quote, I saw with my own eyes how two helicopters were shot down. Afghan Mojahedins were hiding in the mountains very well, and with that, it was very hard to defend the helicopters and airplanes from their attacks. End quote. Afghans used also other means to fight against the Soviet invasion. Both Kruminch and Rusinch state that when the local Afghani shepherds just were moving their herd somewhere and then just suddenly hiding amongst the sheep, there were Afghani soldiers attacking Soviet soldiers. These shepherds mostly were about age of 12, they were planting mines while they were shepherding as well. The little boys of Afghanistan tried to influence the Soviet soldiers with drugs so that they would lessen the ability of actually waging war of the Soviet soldiers. And a lot of them actually took the drugs. Because not everyone could deal with this hard, heavy situation. So to calm down, they used opiates and weed and other drugs 
which often led to terrible consequences. Just imagine, you're, you get sent there to this foreign country. You just got picked up from an army base. You're a Latvian, or Ukrainian, or Armenian, or whatever, even a Russian. You never wanted to serve in the army, but for some reason, you just missed your year of getting into university from high school. You just didn't make the exams or something. Because in Soviet era, there were no centralized tests at the end of the school. There were some to determine your grades. But to get into university, you had to write a specialized, completely different exam. So you fail that exam for a year. And you decide that, oh, well, I'm going to be studying for this year, just working somewhere or doing something else until I can get into university. And then you get drafted. Then you get sent to Afghanistan. You don't know the Afghani people. You do not know what they stand for. You have no idea of what's going on there, unless you're one of the Muslim battalion guys. But mostly you don't know what's going on. You do not want to be there. You are really disillusioned with the Soviet state already. And you just have to go there and kill people. Because of no reason for a country you don't even believe in, which is not even your homeland. And then you break down. You had nothing. And and now there are these 12-year-old Afghanis, which the government tells you to shoot. And they offer you drugs. They offer you an escape form. Now, I know that I would probably take these drugs as well if I would be in such a situation. I can't blame the soldiers. It's not like you could blame the soldiers as well, I think. Because it wasn't the common soldier, as we can see here, who was really enthusiastic of destroying Afghanistan and, and making sure the government oppresses the opposition. The common soldier didn't really care that much. But when you when you just smoke some weed or or just smoke some opium, which you have been given because you're literally a broken man, and then you just wake up to a Kalashnikov staring in your face and you know that you'll be shot at very soon. Now, that would be a terrible situation to be in, I think, and a lot of people were. That wasn't the only only thing which, which happened there. There were a lot of mines and a lot of explosives. Now, Ivar Skruminch left Afghanistan in the 16th of November of 1984. He remembers this as th- he remembers it as this quote I had a very happy feeling we we didn't believe for a very long time that we're actually leaving and we didn't believe that we could leave at all because our airplanes were constantly shot down a lot of a lot of, there were a lot of cases when those who were leaving Afghanistan were shot down and left for dead well i got lucky Another younger sergeant, I guess it's a tradition that Latvians are younger sergeants in the Soviet army, Vence Weinbergs, who was a mortar squad commander in Afghanistan, came into 1985. He drove in in a column of military technique and tanks and armored personal carriers. In his memoirs, he states that, quote, We went to a completely new place of dislocation, around 150 kilometers from the Soviet, uh, Soviet border. Driving through the second largest city of, of Afghanistan, Herat. And then some 30 kilometers more through a concrete road driving forward. It was around Herat. At the edge of the road, we started making a completely new base camp. Where the 12th motorized infantry division was supposed to be dislocated. I served under the first company of this, this division's infantry battalion in the specific scouting squad. We had to keep order in this sector. The scouting squad in which Vence Weidenbergs served were involved into a lot of tiny skirmishes with the Mojahedins. Remembering these events, he tells us, We didn't participate in any strategic battles, but all the time there were some scouting activity with small skirmishes because we were really tiny, tiny military units. We had to stop the Mojahedins armed forces from moving from one settled place to another. We also had to stop uh, the weapon supplies from Iran, which constantly happened through different mountain passes. All of my time of service, I was fighting there. But huge battles happened when the 12th Motorized Infantry Battalion made the strategic sweep in the zone of villages. Technically, the scouting the scouting company didn't frontally got involved in such battles. They had to get involved 
in the case of one of the parts of this this army happened uh, happened to get in get themselves into an ambush or they somehow got involved into into a very bad tactical situation then the task of the scouting company was to try and find a way of <clears throat> getting to the enemy from their backs turning their forces to themselves so that the ambushed and pinned down squad could get some freedom of movement Weinberg talks about a specific case here as well. In the winter of 1985-1986, we had to make a sudden attack, and the result of which was that the part of the Mujahideens had to turn their attention to us. And with this, uh, the, the tanks and the infantry stuck in the very tiny, narrow streets of the city could, could buy some time and, and just retreat. Sergeant Weinbergs has left some very interesting reports about the battle tactics which the Mujahideens used against the Soviet soldiers. Here's what he tells us, quote, During the years where I served, Afghani Mujahideens had been completely moved to a guerrilla war tactics. They didn't move in large squads. Their tactics was to attack the supply columns or singled out lone APCs and armored cars. Now and then, they assaulted the roads and bridge guard posts. Lone tanks and APCs, Mojahedins, tried to destroy in the most different means possible. They used mines and mortars a lot, but mostly mines. During the years when I served, Afghan Mojahedins were really well supplied with the weapons of NATO, and these NATO mines were hard to find with the mine seekers because they weren't from metal, but they were made from plastic. And Mojahedins even managed to turn these mines into so called fugasse. The mining processes were very serious, so that they could even destroy a tank. Because an anti-tank mine can only stop a tank, destroying its treads, but the mine cannot blast through its armor. Mojahedins used a trick to, to fix the situation. So they basically placed 10 to 20 kilograms of trotel under the mine, then they put the mine on it, and then over the mine they also put some 10 to 20 kilograms box of trotel. And the result the potency of the anti-tank mine had been enlarged multiple times. With this power, they could really destroy a tank. Even the turret of the tank could just blow up and just fly in the air after such an explosion. End quote. Weinberg spent all his time near Herat, and for participating in these battles, he also got a medal for courage. He demobilized from Afghanistan in the April of 1986, but he didn't get any promotions, and he was still same state of being the youngest sergeant. Totally from Latvia, 3,640 soldiers were involved. 177 died. Many more had been injured. And one of them is still missing in action. And all of this warfare and all the cruelties that happened during the war were just emphasized and made stronger with the hatred which the Soviet army encountered by the Afghani nationals, because the Soviet army were really, really infamous for unwarranted cruelty and violence toward the, towards the civilians. And although the Soviet army spread a brochure around, which was given to every Soviet soldier that entered Afghanistan, it didn't really help much. The brochure stated, quote, Soviet soldier, while finding yourself in the territory of our friendly Afghanistan, don't forget that you're representing an army which has given a helping hand to the nations of this country towards their war against imperialism and inner reactionary forces. Remember that, according to your actions, the Afghani nation will be thinking about all of the Soviet army, about our grand Soviet fatherland. While you are in the Afghanistan Democratic Republic, please make sure to follow the ethical norms, order, and laws which should be followed by every Soviet citizen. Show respect towards the laws of the Afghani nation and their traditions. Always show goodwill, humanism, justice, and respect towards the working class and the proletariat of the Afghanistan Democratic Republic citizens. But during the war, all these nice statements quickly lost their meaning and were quickly forgotten. 
and the people who suffered the most were elderly people, women and children. I have looked at the various calculations about the sufferings of this war, and about 670,000 up to 1 million civilians died. Many more millions went as refugees to Pakistan, Iran and other countries. Now, I have to be fair here. Both of the warring sides showed an immense amount of cruelty towards each other. We have seen the terrible torture of the Soviet soldiers. At the same time, the Soviet military <clears throat> used the, the so-called scorched earth tactics against the Mujahideens. Villages who provided help to the oppositionary forces, the aviation of the Soviets just wiped off the earth and together with every civilian ever. The land, which could be used for farming, was mined by the Soviets. In the regions controlled by the Mujahideens, the Soviet army meticulously destroyed water supply systems, fields with fields where grain had been sowed, everything that could be used by them. Since 1985, chemical warfare was used against the Afghanis. And that, that included flamethrowers and chemical weapons and other agents. Now, nothing basically changed at the beginning when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. But, step by step, very conservatively, in the politics of the Kremlin, the new ways of thought, new thinking were taking power, although they were resisted by the conservative forces and the communistic party. That, in this case, included both the foreign ministry, the, the general HQ of the Soviet army, and the special services everywhere, basically. Their main argument was that the USSR cannot afford to leave Afghanistan and lose the prestige of a superpower. Ignoring this opposition by the conservative forces in the USSR government, Gorbachev in the 27th Congress of the Communistic Party of the Soviet Union, at the 25th of February in 1986, proclaimed that there must be a plan of removing all the USSR military forces from Afghanistan. First step towards this direction was made in the 27th of April in 1986, when the Communistic Party's Central Committee Politburo decided to just take away the completely compromised, unpopular Afghani leader, Babrak Karmal, and just swapped him with a new leader. The leader of the KGB Outer Surveillance Committee, Vladimir Krychkov, went to Kabul to tell Karmal that his time is past. In the 4th of May, in the 18th Congress of the Afghanistan's National Democratic Party, the new general secretary of the party, was proclaimed, and this was their local GRU's officer, which was the Afghanistan Counterintelligence Agency, HAD, or AJD, Mohammed Najib, who instantly Islamized his own surname and became Najibullah. So, the Soviets decide that the first step of solving the problem is just taking the very, very unpopular old leader away, as usual, and Babrak Karmal just gets sent away and replaced by Muhammad Najibullah. In the 28th of July of 1986, Gorbachev announced that soon about 7,000 people, six groups of the 14th Army, will be removed from Afghanistan. At the 13th of October, again in the, in the assembly of the Communist Party Politburo, the chief of general headquarters, Sergei Akhromeyev, stated that Quote, we are in control of Kabul and the centers of the provinces, but in the occupied territory we still cannot assure the strong power of the government. We have lost the fight of the Afghani nation. In that meeting, it was decided that the Soviet army should be removed from Afghanistan in the period of two years. In the December of 1986, while Najibullah, the Mohammed Najibullah, the new leader of the Afghanistan nation, while he was visiting in Moscow, Gorbachev told him, that the, USSR, that the USSR's departure from the country is unavoidable. Soon after that, the Afghanistan's National Democratic Party's Central Committee Special Extraordinary Session stated that the government shall be moving itself in a way that influences the national cooperation 
between the opposition and the Communist Party and the quicker end of the war. In the 2nd January of 1987, the USSR Defense Ministry's operative group, under the command of General Valentin Varenikov, arrived in Kabul. Since that time, the units of the 14th Army had to formally stop all assault operations. As stated by the Army's last commander, Boris Gromov, quote, the battle operations could happen only then if the life of our soldiers would be threatened, end quote. Disregarding this order, some battles, bigger or smaller, continued throughout the 1987 and 1988. The leaders of Afghanistan, which is the Afghanistan Communistic Party, understood very well that the leaving of the Soviet army doesn't promise them any, any good news. Therefore, they tried to obscure and, and stop the international conversations about the ending of the war. In the January of 1988, both the USSR's foreign minister Edward Chevernadze, who later served as the leader of Georgia after the collapse, collapse of the Soviet Union, and the GRU's main chief, Vladimir Kirchkov, they both had some serious discussions about this with the leader of Afghanistan. Najibullah tried to convince the Soviet leaders to leave at least 10 to 15,000 soldiers in Afghanistan. But the Politburo decided not to. At the end of this visit, a common USSR and Afghanistan statement was created, where for the first time ever, the date upon which the USSR would begin leaving the Afghanistan was, was stated, and it would be the 15th of May. In the 2nd of March of 1988, uh, with the help of United Nations and Switzerland in Geneva, the peace talks had been renewed. This time both the United States of America and the Soviet Union participated. In the 14th of April, the foreign ministers of Afghanistan and Pakistan signed a treaty about the regulations of the political situation in the Afghanistan's Democratic Republic. The guarantees for this deal were both Moscow and Washington. Now, the GRU chief at the time, the Soviet intelligence agency, Vladimir Kruchkov, was very disappointed about this deal, who thought that, that this treaty would end up with the, with the fall of the Najibullah's regime, which was very friendly to the USSR and was basically a puppet regime, and that it would also lead to, to a forming of a pro-American government. Nonetheless, the USSR promised to take their own forces out of the Afghanistan in nine months. United States and Pakistan, however, promised to stop supporting the opposition forces. Now, I have to remind you that one of the people really being supported by the United States in this war was Osama bin Laden, which later, as you all know, formed the bases of Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and were one of the peoples known as terrorists these days. So, you know, this war wasn't as black and white as it appears here. The operation upon which the Soviet Union left the country was called Typhoon. Typhoon. An important role in this very last of the Soviet operations in Afghanistan concerning the planning and the execution, Latvian colonel Dainis Turls. In the 4th of February of 1989, the last USSR military units left Kabul. In the 15th of February of 1989, all of the Soviet military forces had been completely left the territory of Afghanistan. According to the official opinion, the last person who left Afghanistan in an APC was the commander of the 14th Army, Boris Gromov, which, in the border city Tremeza, border city with Uzbekistan, told to the journalists who arrived there, <clears throat> quote, Behind me, there are no Soviet soldiers remaining there. But it wasn't completely true, of course. Oh wait, Soviet Union lying to their own people? After, when the USSR stopped the military aid to Afghanistan, the government of Najibullah didn't held long. In the April of 1992, Mojaheddin's just overthrew it. Now, there are some news circulating around the population, of course, and this is where the unreliable element comes in here. But there are some news that Edward Chevernadze, who was still the USSR's foreign minister at the time, offered to Mohammed Najibullah a political asylum in Moscow, but the president of Afghanistan had refused it. After the creation of the Mojahedin government, Najibullah went to the United Nations mission in Kabul and stayed there for a while not to be killed. In 1996, Mojahedin were replaced by Taliban in power, who really didn't care about diplomatic immunity. 
the Taliban took the United Nations building, arrested Najibullah, and after very terrible, terrible torment in that very day, hanged him without court or any investigation. Altogether, in the Afghanistan war, which, which was during from the 25th of December of 1979 until the 2nd February of 1989, in the Soviet side fought about 6,200,000 soldiers of whom 525,200, of which 62,900 were officers, were the Soviet Union's and Afghanistan government's armed forces, 90,000 of which were in the Border Guard and other units of KGB, because yes, of course, all the Border Guard was under KGB. 5,000 fighting in this were also in the internal ministry of the USSR and the armed forces of the militia. By the militia, I mean the Soviet police service. 86 soldiers and officers had received the, the Hero of the Soviet Union title. And, like I said, from Latvia, in the Afghanistan war, there were 3,640 3, soldiers participating. Altogether, 15,051 soldiers of the Soviet Union died. Either shot in battle, died from the wounds, or just died in some accident or from disease. And in addition to that, almost 54,000 people were traumatized or wounded in this war. Four generals were, amongst the, were among the dead. There were 417 Soviet soldiers who went missing in action or became prisoners, of whom 130 were released and returned to the USSR. Like I said, there were 177 dead from those who fought from Latvia, one of them missing in action still, the Soviet army lost 147 tanks, 1,314 armored vehicles, 510 engineering vehicles, 11,369 trucks and fuel supply vehicles, 433 artillery machines, 118 airplanes, 333 helicopters. Yeah, huge losses there. $800 million of the governmental budget each year were spent to support the obedient to Moscow Afghanistan government. But the support of the 14th Army and the keeping up of the battle operations cost the Soviet Union about $3 billion a year. Together, in the 10 years of war, $38 billion were spent. Those are $38 billion which weren't spent for feeding the country which was starving in an economical stagnation and where people were suffering, as I told you the last time. $38 billion just spent for the army in a war of, on Afghanistan land, after which nothing was gained, many lives were lost, and a lot of lives changed after that. Against the invaders, about 150,000 Afghan Mojahideens were fighting. Now, we don't know the exact casualties of the Afghan Mojahideens, but according to the data given to us by the Professor Mark Kramer of the Harvard University, during the war either killed or incapacitated were about 2.5 million people of Afghanistan, of whom the biggest part were civilians. Many millions more left the country as refugees. Now, notable are the words said by the famous Soviet dissident and defender of human rights academic Andrei Sakharov, the author of Gulag Archipelago, said in the U USSR's first deputies of the nation congress, which was basically all the common people of the Soviet Union in the communistic party, which had never arrived together. And he said that, that <clears throat> quote, we in the Soviet Union call the soldiers who fought in the Afghanistan Afghans, but the suffering of the real Afghanis have been forgotten. And the people who lived next door to Afghanistan also suffered. For example, in 1987, during four months in Pakistan, uh, more than 300 civilians died because of aggressive aerial assaults and bombing by the Afghan government, the pro-Kremlin Afghan government. Now, the leader of the 14th Army, General Boris Gromov, has stated that the USSR didn't lose this war, because the army had fulfilled all the tasks given to it. But the Mojahideens 
had never really taken any very important Afghanistan city. But you really can't agree to this statement. Of course, just Mujahideen guerrillas armed with Kalashnikovs and other infantry weaponry who didn't have enough of artillery or barely any artillery or aviation or tanks couldn't really destroy the technically superior and much more numerous Soviet army. But we should really look at the ending of this war to see who won and who lost there. The Soviet army couldn't really fulfill their direct task of strengthening the positions of the communist Afghani government, and they really couldn't keep upholding the socialistic order in this country. Instead, they had to leave this country due to the Afghani resistance. Leaving the puppet government ruled over by Moscow to its own fate, which really ended when they were hanged by Talibs. So, the war had ended, and you now know its impact upon the people of the USSR. But what of it? Sadly, when researching for this show, I encountered an important problem here in Latvia. Nobody cares. I mean, more likely I hope, that people remember their Vietnam War vets in the United States. But our country is nowhere near that militarized, and although we had our own Veterans Day recently, called Lajplejdien, in the 11th of November, the only soldiers that we remembered were those that fought in World War I, and after that in the Latvian Liberty battles against the Bolsheviks and the army of Bermontovalov. Even veterans of the World War II, for both sides, have their memorial days. 9th of May for those who fought in the Red Army, and the 16th of March for those who fought in Wehrmacht against the Soviets. <laughs> now, this is a good time to remind you again, Westerners, that yes, we do celebrate and memorize our veterans who fought against the Soviet Union, because Hitler had promised them an independent Latvia, so they gave their all to drive communists out of this country. But... Said trekking away, the memorial day in Latvia for the Afghanistan war is on the 15th of February, the day the USSR forces finally left that country. Nobody remembers that day. And there are no flags in the streets like it is on other memorial days. It is as if we have completely forgotten and don't care that our country's young had been conscripted by an army in which they didn't want to serve, to go fight people who had done them nothing wrong, and dying so that the upper echelons could feel better about it. Two of my previously mentioned Afghanistan war veteran sources. Gunars and Einars, in an interview to our local television, LNT, stated that, quote, The only people understanding and remembering us are ourselves. Nobody thinks or cares about those who had to fight in Afghanistan for a foreign government against their will, completely for nothing. It is as if the war never happened. End quote. And now remember how the war culturally impacted the generation in the last years of the Soviet Union. How it inspired the people to find their purpose at home. How it basically kick-started the Latvian independence movement. Nobody asked these men's permission to call them to arms and drag them into a foreign land. Quoting Gunnars again. In the 15th of February, which is our anniversary, each year we meet by the memorial stone. You can see by the faces of the people who have gathered here with what pain they have arrived. The soldiers are there, their relatives, mothers of the fallen, who still await their sons coming home from the war. Not that it's a new thing. The Soviet government, too. They just left us there. We didn't get any special treatment, and we didn't even know that we should maybe be getting some psychological help back then. Not that we have received any help now. End quote. This war, which my government has deleted from its pages of history, influenced a whole generation, destroyed families and changed people's lives. And they haven't even received as much, for, much from my country as a free consultation by a psychotherapist? To maybe help them get over all of this? And by now I think that all the world knows that Afghanistan is a hellhole, impossible to subdue fully because of terrain and mentality. I am ashamed for this treatment of our veterans, which is also one of the reasons why this show wasn't easy to make for me. A wife of a veteran states that We're not asking much. Just please, admit that this historically painful time even existed. The government should take responsibility for these soldiers who fought a foreign war in a foreign land. They had no opinion of refusing. They were just taken from the street and dragged away. And whether you survive or not, that's completely unto you. Not that the situation in the West is any better. 
I mean, sure, everybody knows that the United States supported guys who became terrorists later. But unlike other wars, people tend to think that the soldiers fighting in this one were just machines. I hope I've changed that a bit for you, because the Afghanistan war hasn't gone into history as much as any other wars. That is a that is a shame, really, and and I think that both the Russians and Belarusians and and Ukrainians and all the other nations who lived in the USSR, they remember this war. I think there are there are veterans everywhere, and Russian ultra nationalists in the 9th of May for some reason go to the victory monument of the World War Two with their imperialistic even monarchistic Russian flags and yell that, yes, our soldiers were the best. They're a very huge minority, don't worry about it, but it seems kind of silly to glorify a certain war and then just to completely ignore the other one that happened. It was a deep blow to mentality. It was this sense of defeat, this sense of impending doom, which, which was there for the end of the war. I would say, even beginning with 1984. And Gorbachev, all the way up from his coming to power to the very end of it, tried to pull it together. And this is why when we'll finally get to Perestroika, just keep remembering that all the time when Gorbachev is making his changes, when he's trying to pull it through, trying to make the Soviet Union a better place to live, and talking about all these changes, a war is going on in the background. People are dying. People are terrified, and a lot of people are just very touched and influenced by the war. And even then, Gorbachev worries about the administrative apparatus and things that the Soviet Union should be kept together, should be more centralized, should be upheld as a value of some sorts. Previous wars had gone a bit better for the Soviets, as you heard in the previous episodes, but this one, this one changed all of it. Especially when, when Brezhnev died in 1982, he didn't even see the end of the war. Yuri Andropov, the KGB chief, which was also participating into this war, became the general secretary of the state, and there were a bunch of jokes made about them. And the next episode, which will cover the Moscow Olympics and some points of Yuri Andropov's, and after that, Chernyenko's reign, which were very short, because they were really old, it'll be a bit funnier than this one. But the trauma of all of this, and I'll put, I'll make sure to put it in the notes of accompanying the show, some link to this Is It Easy to Young movie. It, it really spawned something here in Latvia. It is as if a new wound had opened. It is as if they, they took our young, the Soviet leadership took our young, and then amongst all this pointlessness, it's not enough that you live among it. It's just now you have to fight and die for it? Against people who just blow you up, fight guerrilla war, and you can't do really anything to them. Even though you outnumber them and outtake them, they still beat you. And of course people were, like I said before, turning to drugs and alcohol because of this. No motivation, no morale, no anything for the army. And even the Muslim battalions... The Soviet leadership really thought the Muslim battalions could make a difference because they were made up from these very Afghani-like people. But they didn't. They didn't want to kill fellow Muslims there. And after the recent Paris terror acts, we might think that all Muslims are some sort of terrible evil beings, but frankly, that Muslims, one, don't really like other Muslims that much either, especially when it comes to Shia-Sunni differences, and second... They're just people, most of them. They also don't want to kill fellow people for some random ideological goal. But that's what happened. This this is what makes this war, like, really pointless. At least in Vietnam War, you, you Americans listening to this show, at least you know that your country had a clear ideological goal to preserve freedoms and everything. But in this one... When a common soldier knows that he's living in a country which doesn't respect him, doesn't provide for his needs, and doesn't do anything good for him, and he's disillusioned about it anyways, and now he's being forced, just like previously in Czechoslovakia and Hungary, just to force upon, just to force his Soviet will and this terrible Soviet lifestyle off to, off onto other people who are technically more free than you are, well, that's a bit terrible. Of course, there was no morale there. Now, unlike 
Czechoslovakia and Hungary, this failed because of the terrain and the fanaticism of the Mujahideen defenders. And, well, the United States and the United Nations in general didn't give any help to Czech Republic or Hungary before that. But this happened. And this is a page of history that really shouldn't be forgotten. And that's it for today's show. Thank you for listening again. I'll be honest with you, I can't really promise you a precise date when the next show is going to come out. All in all, I'm trying to secure a position as a foreign reporter for some foreign newspaper, some Finnish, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, even American maybe, sending my resumes and cover letters everywhere. If you know anyone who works in some sort of editorial office, then write to my mail and I'll try to try to send them my resume as well. Because that would really improve both the quantity and the quality of this podcast, if you would do so. But I suppose that's the only help I could really ask of you without without compromising my consciousness too much. So, thank you to everyone who have donated thus far, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you for listening, and until next time, tovarishi. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.